Hi, everybody, and welcome to this free live stream workshop uh, entitled Get Over Yourself. A lot of people really don't even understand what this workshop's about, and I made it free because I really believe it's one of the most important workshops I teach. This Get Over Yourself workshop, I want to explain where this actually started from. It didn't start with music, um, although there's so much that goes on, even, even behind the scenes uh, with, with performers and things like that, that I've been thinking about for quite some time, actually for several years. But uh, last year I was at the dentist and there was a woman there, an elderly woman. I don't know how old she was, but she was up there. Um, I would venture to say 90s, maybe, I don't know. She was very small, very frail. She had a walker. And uh, evidently, I, either somebody dropped her off. I don't even know how she got there. But uh, she was at the dentist, and she kept trying to use the clipboard, you know, to sign, and it kept falling off of her lap. And so I went over, and I just I picked it up, and I says, "Can I can I hold this for you?" And so she filled out the forms, and I said, "Do you want me to put it up there?" And she said, "Yes, thank you." And she said, "I had to go up there in a minute, but that'll help." There were two other people in the waiting room. They were not together. They were my age or younger. They were probably younger. They weren't together. One was sitting here. One was sitting over here. I was kind of sitting between them. And uh, so I, I did that. And then I got on the, the cell phone and I started talking. And I was kind of walking around. So I wasn't looking at this lady anymore because she was settled. And uh, I kept hearing like a bumping, like a thumping sound. And I looked up. And I was still on the phone. I looked up and she was trying to get through those heavy hydraulic doors that she had to pull out to go to the restroom. And it kept hitting her walker. So it hit her walker, she'd lose the grip, it would shut. And it happened several times. Again, I heard the sound, but it didn't register because I was talking. And I, I turned around and I saw the two people and they were sitting there like this with their arms crossed, their legs stretched out like, you know, kind of across the ankles, both of them. One was a man, one was a woman. And they were actually smiling, watching this lady struggle. And, and this all happened in a matter of seconds. I was horrified. Uh, I jumped and, and literally ran across the room to help her, but she had, she had gotten through. But I left thinking a whole lot differently about things and people. And I, I sat there stunned. And I thought, is this the kind of world we're now living in? where people are so self-centered, so self-absorbed that they get enjoyment out of watching someone elderly struggle. I mean, they had a smirk, they had a smile, it was a smirk on their face watching her trying to get through that door. And I thought, I cannot believe this is what we're, we're living in and dealing with. And by the way, that directly affects music. All right. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. And, and what, what a lot of this comes down to is I don't care if you're a professional. I don't care if you're a raw beginner. We take ourselves way too seriously, way too seriously with what we do. I, I, I think it's, you know, it's two extremes in the musical journey. You're either learning or you are, you're somewhere in the middle or you're an advanced player or you're a professional. And this really fits everybody, but it doesn't matter where we're at. I will say this, we take ourselves way, way too seriously. Uh, and, and by the way, when I say being self-centric or self-absorbed or self-centered or the ego, so you know, we all have it. Everybody has it. Um, some have it to different degrees. Some have it because they're just starting out and they're struggling and they don't want to feel stupid. They don't want to feel, um, you know, they, they don't want to make a mistake. Um, they don't want to, you know, feel foolish in front of others. That's ego. Uh, there are those who are are very confident what they do, and they they are performers. Some people aren't performers, but they they are very arrogant. All right, in what they do. I don't care what extreme. Everybody has an ego. Everybody is self centered to a degree, and that's what I want to talk with. And that's what we're talking about when it comes to music. Um, but we do take ourselves, we're, we're too internally focused and we're too self-absorbed. And I'm going to give you an example. If you, if you ever post something on Facebook, I have a friend, uh, they're fabulous musicians. Uh, they're one of my favorite people 
to listen to. Um, I have their CD. Uh, they live up in Michigan. Uh, they play Irish music, and I I love to hear them play. They're excellent. And she told me she said I would never post a video on on YouTube. And she says because I am too thin skinned to handle the criticism of people not liking my videos. And she said I don't play so that I get people's approval, but I also don't want to put myself out there, which which I feel bad about that. And uh, last night uh, I talked to my patrons about some stuff as far as YouTube and liking and disliking. And uh, if we have time, we'll get into that. But if not, let me just say this. You can have you can have a thousand likes on your YouTube channel and you can have one unlike. And what do we focus on? All right. We obsess because somebody didn't like my video. And, and by the way, we all do that. We all was like, why didn't they like my video? How, why, why'd they do that? And, and we get really upset and we forget all the people that enjoyed it and who gave us a thumbs up and we focus on that one negativity. All right, again, because we take ourselves so extremely serious. So uh, I, I was teaching at a uh, music store in Ohio and there was a, we were having a, a jam and it was really a beginner's jam. And somebody came in, a lady came in and she had a, um, a blue lion. And at the time, blue lions, and they're not as much anymore. There's, there's a lot of good dulcimer companies out there and blue lions are still very good dulcimers. Don't get me wrong, they're, they're extremely nice dulcimers. But at that time, they were like the Martin guitar of dulcimers. And you know, if you had one, you, you, know, you, you had respect kind of a thing, you know how that goes. Anyhow, she came in and she was, you could just tell when she came in, she was about herself. She came in, I could not get her to smile. Now I know this because I timed it. I followed her around the store for 45 minutes trying to make her smile. That's what I did. I was trying to get her to laugh, to joke something, but she was just so serious about how she played and just who she was. So we did the jam and the next morning I got a phone call from her at the store and she said, just like this, next time you have a jam, I would really appreciate it if you didn't have a bunch of beginners there. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled and I said, well, I'm really recommending that next time we have a jam, you don't attend. And she, she was like, pardon me. And she was really offended. And I, I just kind of laughed. And I said, you know, that was advertised as a beginner jam. And if you come to a beginner jam, you don't expect beginners to play advanced stuff. And you need to expect to play beginner stuff. And, you know, and by the way, by the end of it, we were friends. You know, she was joking. She was laughing. But it was just that. Let me just tell you something, folks. It's a dulcimer. All right. It's a banjo. It's a ukulele. It's not brain surgery. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And I'm not, I'm not knocking down what we play or what we do. But when you put things in the big scheme of things, it's a banjo, it's a ukulele, it's a dulcimer. And we get so, sometimes there are some people who get, take themselves so seriously about this. And we need to lighten up when it comes to that. I'll give you another example. Uh, I had a, a, and this is when I say it's not brain surgery. Uh, when I was teaching banjo, I had at the music store, I had a, a doctor, he was a heart surgeon. In fact, he was a very well-known heart surgeon who traveled the world, he gave lectures and, uh, and he, he was still active. I don't know that he continued to do the surgery and you need to understand what I'm telling you it had nothing to do with his surgery skills. He, he was a, he's an excellent surgeon. Um, but when we would do banjo lessons, he would literally, he'd, he'd sit there and shake like this because he was so afraid, he was so nervous. And I said, I, just, I said, Jerry, it's a banjo. I said, you hold people's hearts in your hands. You save people's lives. What you do is a matter of life and death. This is a banjo. And and he says, I know, he said, I just get so nervous around you. And we all do this. How many's ever, and I, I do this, you make a mistake and you say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is the teacher supposed to say, 
I forgive you. But that's what we do. And, and, and this doctor, I mean, when he was in surgery, his hands were, you know, I'm sure like a rock. But over something as, and I'll say it, as silly as trying to learn a banjo compared, I say it's silly compared to doing open heart surgery, put it in perspective and playing a banjo does not compare. So that's, that's the way we are. And, and this is what I wanna say about that. Everybody, this is what we forget. Everybody is an expert at something, everybody. Uh, I know there's somebody and I think she's on, but I noticed in her email, it said uh, pottery. All right, so I'm assuming she does pottery. All right, if I was in a pottery class that she was teaching, I would be nervous and silly and I would feel, not silly, I would feel insecure, all right? Just if you wanna put something in there, what, what do you do? Tell me, tell me what you do, what are you an expert at? Because everybody's an expert at something. And in the chat, there are things that, it, that you could teach a workshop and you would be completely confident in and you wouldn't be insecure because you know what you're doing and you're very confident in that. So if you wanna put that in the chat, go ahead. I'd like to see it myself. Uh, but everybody is an expert at something. And when we realize that, just because I can do this and I can't do that does not make me any less of a person or any more inferior than anyone else. Okay. Music and sewing. Who did that? Gail. Okay. I couldn't sew anything. <laughs> and by the way, even in music, you know, I don't, I don't read music. Oh, geez. You're all hit my weaknesses. Um, <laughs> where was that? Uh, oh, even in music, I don't read any music. I don't, I don't read a note of music. Um, do I feel inferior to somebody who does read music? Absolutely not, not at all. Because I can play the way I play without having to do that. Somebody said math, math is like, whoa, that was my worst subject in school. Um, felting, I've never done that. Energy management, never done that. See, and, and again, these are all things. Now, here's my question. Uh, how many in here, I can't see your hands, but we're just going to do this here. How many of you don't know how to change the oil in your car? If you can't, do you feel stupid and inferior because you don't? How many don't know how to sew? All right. If you don't know how to sew, do, do you feel stupid because you don't know how to sew? And and that's kind of how we are. There, there are so many things we don't know anything about, but we don't feel insecure or inferior about it. But we tend to do it with music. We tend to do it with what we're trying to learn. And we, we have this either overconfidence or underconfidence of what we can do. Um, here's, here's what a lot of people don't get. And, and I'm, I'm just being really honest with you. Um, I had somebody call me up. She, I don't know if she's on or not. I had somebody call me up. And when I answered the phone, she was so excited. And she says, I can't believe I got to talk to you. Um, you've made my day because I didn't think think I'd actually get to talk to to you and I'm gonna be honest with you I, I'm like I was kind of embarrassed I, and I'm thinking well I'm kind of honored to talk to you um, I, there are so many people though who who take that stuff so seriously um, I remember I was a missionary in Kenya I remember when I was going to Kenya and I had these dear sweet little ladies come up take my hand with tears in their eyes and saying you're sacrificing so much and i'll be honest with you i was i was young i was in my 20s i didn't feel like i was sacrificing anything at all you know but there are people out there who would have responded and said oh yes i'm sacrificing you know and they have that that again that that taking themselves so so very so very seriously um you know you could take the biggest name in our communities i don't care if it's dulcimer i don't care if it's banjo i don't care if it's guitar i don't care if it's ukulele take the biggest name you can think of right now go to town ask somebody in the, in the grocery store if they've ever heard of that person they're going to say absolutely not you know the people that we're familiar with that we hold up is to be these great performers and i'm not saying they're not please understand that they're very big fish in a very very small pond all right, so we need to understand that. And by the way, many of them will tell you that themselves, that they are just big fish in a very, very small pond. Um, we get the idea 
And and, and uh, let me just say this to put all this into perspective. Um, this is a joke. Uh, well, it's become a joke. When I'm introduced at a lot of festivals, um, I'm introduced as a really nice guy. <laughs> that used to bother me. Uh, I'm not introduced as the great hammer dulcimer player, or the great mountain dulcimer player, or the great banjo player, or ukulele player. I'm introduced as he's a really nice guy. And that, that used to really kind of bother me. And that's a joke now, because uh, if you all know Phyllis Woods Brown, if she ever is around and I'm introduced like that, she will just crack up laughing because she's heard it enough times and we've joked about it. But, but let me tell you this very sincerely. In the big picture of things, putting things in perspective of whatever size pond, I would much rather be known as a nice guy than a great player. Because I know people who are, and I'm not, I'm not gossiping, I'm not mentioning any names. I know some absolutely wonderful performers who are absolutely horrible in their personal lives and the way they treat others. I would rather be known as the nice guy than the great performer. All right, now that's just me. I don't know about you, um, but that's, it doesn't bother me anymore now. I, I think it's kind of funny. I have a couple of people who actually joke about it. A lot of people now who joke about it, uh, about that part of it. So some people, you know, some people are arrogant and they actually know it. I taught this, the same workshop I'm teaching now at Everett, Michigan. And uh, I had a, a lady who was teaching another workshop on how to perform. And she said almost every one of their stu her students said, how do I not be cocky and arrogant? and prideful, which I give them credit that they recognize that, but it kind of blows my mind that people take themselves so seriously that they feel that way. I don't know if that even makes sense to everybody. So some people know it. Uh, some people don't know it. All right, and I'll give you an idea. Have you ever gone to a jam and somebody dominates the jam? <laughs> go, Brad, go. <laughs> uh, they dominate the jam. In other words, what they do is they, and I've seen this happen uh, two or three times. What they'll do is they'll say, <laughs> they'll say, does anybody know this song? And, and it's a song, obviously. Nobody knows, but they perform very well. And what they'll, what they'll do is they'll ask you, and then they'll say, well, let me, let me play it for you. And then as soon as they're done, well, do you know this song? Do you know this song? And basically they're performing for you throughout the jam, All right? Now some people don't understand or see that as arrogant in themselves. And maybe they do, I'm not judging that. By the way, some people are misjudged as being arrogant. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example. I know a girl when I was uh, teaching in youth groups, I was teaching at a, at a school uh, in a chapel and I was talking about where the Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen. Uh, than silver or gold. And I, I had all the kids' names and I said, I just want you to put one word beside each of their names that would represent that person. And there was one girl who was, who was very pretty, very quiet, very shy. And a lot of the, comp and by the way, the kids didn't get to see these. I saw these, but she had like Ice Princess or, or Stuck Up or something like that. Now I knew the girl personally. I knew that she was extremely shy and she was the opposite of what that was. And I actually asked her, I said, you know, I shoot her and I said, can I, can I bring this out? And, and I explained it. I said, you know, we, people who've written this have misjudged her because that's not her. By the way, I've had that happen to me. Uh, I'm not really a out there person. Um, I, I, somebody once thought and, and they know this now, they thought that, that I was arrogant because I didn't really get out there and I was always kind of backed off. And uh, it was because I was shy because I was actually very insecure and not confident and it came across the wrong way. Um, but, but let me tell you this, how many ever thought that when you become a better player, when you get very confident with what you do, that you actually feel more secure and you're not so worried about what other people think. 
a lot of people think that, you know, if I get really good at this, then I'm not going to feel so insecure and, and I'm just going to be able to play and I'm not going to worry about what other people think of me because, you know, on and on and on, because that is what we tend to do. That is the exact opposite of the truth. The bigger you get, the bigger the ego gets. And I'm just going to tell you this. I don't care who they are. And I know them. All performers are insecure. All of them. Um, I've had many one-on-ones with people uh, who, who have admitted, and I've admitted that, we're all insecure. So, so whether you're struggling down here or whether you're up here, there's still insecurity. Um, talking about making mistakes. And, and when I say that, um, when I say they're all insecure, let me clarify that because maybe that's not exactly, exactly true or not to the extent that, that I'm saying. Um, I'm going to give you a perfect example. Joe Collins, if you know Joe Collins, he's a two-time national champion, great guy, Mountain Dolphin player. Uh, I was talking to Joe Collins about this like six years ago, and and he was saying, you know, everybody makes mistakes, and he said, I make mistakes, and and I really don't care. And and we were talking about it, and that night he was the headliner of the program of the show, and he made a mistake every single song to the point he actually had to start over, which you don't ever really do that. And he said that. He said, I got to start over. And and here's what he did. He laughed about it the whole entire time. He joked about it the whole entire time. He let it roll off his back. And I even talked to him afterward about it. And he said, Brett, I don't really care. He said, I know I can play that stuff. He said, everybody has a bad night. Everybody makes mistakes. And this is the truth. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. If you get up there and you play something and you make a mistake, nobody's going, oh, I can't believe they made a mistake. That My wife says, that's how I always talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, I just thought that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you talk about how your husband talks, he talks like this, uh, or your wife, or whatever. Anyhow, uh, that's that's what I'm talking about. Every everybody, though, you know, Joe Joe has conquered that. All right, um, I've conquered it a lot. Uh, I had one performer um, call me up angry because I was doing free lessons on YouTube. By the way, if you're not a subscriber on YouTube, please subscribe to my channel on YouTube uh, and hit the notification bell to get notifications. I've got free lessons. I put a new one up every week, if you're not aware of that, uh, for five different instruments. But I had somebody call me up very, very upset that I was doing that. And uh, we talked, and this person said to me, and this is after we talked a little bit, and they said, you know something? They said, I'm a dinosaur. Nobody, nobody remembers me. Nobody, you know, I used to be somebody in the, in the dulcimer world. Nobody even knows who I am anymore. And, and, and kind of feeling very insecure. And, and I said, you know, that's, that's not true at all. I said, when I go to festivals, I hear your name. I hear people talk about you. And, and basically I, and I don't mean insincerely, I basically buttered this person up and I made them feel secure and, I really just really try to encourage this person. And by the way, we were friends by the end of it. But again, here's another top notch performer saying the same thing. I'm a dinosaur. Nobody likes me. Nobody. And, and I'm telling you, I know performers come off with all this confidence and some of them are just it's second nature and they do have that confidence. And maybe they're on the other scale. Maybe they're on the arrogant side and, and maybe they're not on either side. I'm just saying it's very common. If you feel insecure and you feel, you know, like you want to just curl up and don't want to, so, you know, you're not only not the, you're not the only person like that. You're in a big crowd of a whole lot. You're, you're in a big pond with, uh, with everybody. All right. Because everybody feels that way. And, and I said this so many times, we are so, so stinking hard on ourselves and so self-critical because we are so self-centered. We're so focused on us. Um, let me ask you this. How many's ever gone to a jam and the person beside you is tuning and you're sitting there just playing away on your instrument or you're the person doing the tuning and somebody beside you is sitting there and 
strumming away on the instrument. And you sit there and you get annoyed, but then you turn around and you do the same thing. How many's ever done that? Yeah, why? Because we're not thinking about them. We're thinking about us, what I want to do. Um, and again, here, here's what I'm telling you this. Uh, I actually have a page on Facebook called Purposeful Humanity. Here's the, here's the point of it is to, to not be like that has to take purpose. So here's, here's one of the points I want to make. Uh, you want to plan, you want to find your purpose in your music and you want to pl plan for that. So I'm going to, some of you know this and some of you don't, and I just mentioned this lately and I, I tell these stories so often I sometimes forget who I've told it to, but I know we've got a lot of new people. Um, I wrote a book, uh, a song called The Unwalked Trail and, uh, it's in, it's in a couple of my books. Uh, I have a Gettysburg Rain and other tunes of the heart are all tunes that I wrote. And they all have a story behind them because when you are playing, if you have a story, if you have, you can put emotion to it. And uh, I'm just gonna tell you this as quick as I can. About three years ago, my dad had open heart surgery. It was over Christmas. They told us he was going to pass away, that he was gonna die. It was the first Christmas I ever had without my dad. I remember sitting, watching my mother at Christmas, us knowing he was going to pass. We didn't know when. They didn't. They didn't give us. You know, they didn't tell us how long. They just said he's not going to make it. And we were basically going through Christmas mourning for my dad. And while we were, you know, over Christmas, um, sometime another doctor came in and they got him on a prescription on a pill. And he 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 was out of the hospital in two days. I mean, it's just. It just fixed him. And, uh, and then when he kind of got, uh, you know, back on his feet a little bit, they decided to move to Florida, which I, they needed to move to Florida. They needed to, you know, they lived on a hill. They couldn't do the winters. You know, it was just, it was just too much on them. And uh, so they moved, they moved to Florida and, and I thought, you know, I'm losing my dad a second time. And uh, so I went down there to visit and they lived in the condo and behind the condo, they have a, nature preserve, a trail that goes like between a gulf and, or a bay and the, and ponds. And I was walking with my dad the very first day and, you know, he's on his cane and, and by the way, he doesn't use a cane now, but he was on his cane and I was just walking and I looked over and he's, you know, he's keeping up and I said, ah, oh, dad, I'm so sorry. I said, I, I didn't mean to walk so fast. And he said, no, he said, we're good. He said, we need to do this every single day. We need to, we need to walk this trail. And the only reason I really wanted to walk the trail was for my dad. I was there for about a week and a half and we never walked that trail again. We did everything, but I mean, we went places, we went out with, you know, my mom and everything and uh, my sister, but we never walked that trail. And I was getting ready to leave. My mom was saying goodbye. And uh, she started crying, which made me cry. And then, you know, my dad walked down to the car with me because I had to get his car because he had moved it. And he just said very, not, not meaning anything. He just said, you know, we never walked that trail again. And that just went right through my heart. And I got in my car and as I was pulling away and pulling out of the complex and for probably the next three or four miles, I was sobbing so hard I couldn't see the road. I almost had to pull over and I thought, I'm never gonna walk that trail again with my dad. He's gonna die before I get this, this opportunity. And I wrote a song called The Unwalked Trail. And when I, when I perform and I, I tell that story and I've had a dozen men write me and say that song changed the relationship I have with my dad. When I played it at Everett, the first time a man left right after that, and he went out to an outbuilding and he called his dad and said, dad, I gotta talk to you. I gotta tell you, I love you. I would rather have a song that I performed change somebody's life than I would 10 standing ovations. That's my purpose. All right, by the way, uh, my dad's doing well. <laughs> my mom passed away about a year after that. Um, and we have walked that trail uh, several times um, again. So, but I tell that story and uh, 
it's changed people. And there's there are several songs like that. So here's why I'm telling you this, because I and I'm being honest, I am not a wild player. There are people who, when you watch them play, your jaw drops and you think, oh my word, wow, they are amazing. All right. So here's here's what I'm saying. I'm not a wild person. I will never be a wild person. Playing aside, I don't have the personality of being a wow person. A wow person is, and I've had some, I've, I've had people tell me this who are professional musicians who said, and I'm not saying this, they're saying this, that being a wow performer is 75% ham and 25% talent. I don't know if that's true or not. I do know I've heard some performers play though, and I'm like, how in the world do they do that? I mean, they're phenomenally amazing. I am not a wild player, so I'm not going to strive to be a wild player. I know what my purpose is, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on my purpose. I'm not going to try to be like somebody else. All right, and I hope that makes sense. Um, you could talk to several different people and ask them, and they'll all tell you, don't try to be like, uh, I'm just going to throw out a name, don't, don't try to be like Mark Allen Wade. There's already one Mark Allen Wade. That's him. You be you, you be somebody else. Um, so here's why I want to tell you this. Um, uh, I'll tell you two things because we sometimes you think, well, uh, you know, a wild player is, is this or that. There was a show called uh, uh, America's Best. I think it was on two winters ago. It's kind of like America's Got Talent that was in the winter and it was worldwide and it had worldwide judges. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Uh, the, the kid who won, when I saw him play, I thought he's winning this whole competition at the end of this season. Uh, he was, I think, nine years old, uh, and I think he, he was from India, and he was about nine years old. And he got up and he played Flight of the Bumblebee on a piano, and he had a metronome going. It, which threw me, I thought, because, you know, wh why are you using a metronome if you, you know, if you already play? Well, anyhow, he played it, he doubled the metronome and played it again. So he played Flight of the Bumblebee twice as fast what it's normally played, note for note perfect. Then he tripled it, which it's a very short song when it is tripled. But he tripled it and it blew everybody away. And here's, here's one of the first thing the judges said. That was phenomenal how fast and how well and, and precise you played. But next time you play, we don't want to see the wow. We want to see what's in your heart. We want you to play from your heart, and that's what we want to see. And I'm just going to tell you something. That, that meant a lot to me personally, because here you have a world stage, world judges, and here's what they're saying. What matters is, is what you play from here, not how well, what a wow you are. Now, here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Here's what I'm saying. There's wild players. There's kind of my kind of players and there's everybody in between who play for different things and have different results. Here's what I'm saying. Find what you are and focus on that and don't focus on this. Um, I know two performers who played at a concert. One was a wild player. The other was a harp player, all right? They, they played for the same reason that I say that I play, and that's to touch people. And this person who did the, the harp playing uh, contacted me and said, I really do not want to play before the WoW player. And I said, why? And they said, well, because they're a WoW player and I'm not. And here's what I said to them. I said, you know something, here's the difference. Every single time you play, you make people laugh and you make people cry and you make people feel emotion. You're not the wild player. The wild player makes their jaw drop. And I says, but think back on performances that you have seen or things. What, what ones do you remember? And I'll be honest with you, the ones I remember, the ones that made me cry, the ones that touched my heart.
one's better than the other. What I'm saying is for this person, I said, don't worry about what they're doing. Do what you do and do it. Make people laugh, make people cry, touch their hearts and don't care what the other person's doing. And after the concert, that same person called me and said that was the best advice because <laughs> the other person, they went crazy over them. Um, and they said, uh, but that person didn't make anybody laugh. That person didn't make anybody cry. But when I played, they did. All right. So here's what I'm saying. Find your purpose and then focus on your purpose. All right. It, flourish in that purpose. Uh, when you're talking about being nervous to play and being afraid to play, the question is, and by the way, I understand it. And that's in that other workshop. I get that a hundred percent, but I got over it. All right. And one of the, the reasons I got over it is because, because one, I really don't care anymore, but here's why I don't care because I am not performing to please somebody. I'm not performing to, and I'm not saying anybody is, I'm not trying to show how wonderful, wonderful I am. I make mistakes all the time. Um, I'll give you this example. Uh, when my mom did pass away, uh, Kim sang at the funeral and she sang, it is well. I keep getting mixed up, but I think it is, it is well. And Kim is his wife, by the way. What? I said Kim is his wife. Kim is my but, wife. And she, they know that. Most of them know that. Was, yeah. it, was it it as well? Yes. Okay. And while she was singing it, she looked over at the casket and her voice hitched and, and cracked. And there was, I mean, it was obvious. And she came back and she sat down and she said, I am so sorry that I made a mistake. And I said, what, what mistake? And I knew what she was talking about. And she said, when my voice hitched, and I said, that, that wasn't a mistake at all. I said, do you think people really are here because they want to hear you sing perfectly or because do they want to see how much you love my mother? And, and I'm going to tell you what, what she referred to as a mistake was a blessing, not only to me because I saw how much she loved my mother. It was a blessing to my dad. It was a blessing to everybody else. It's not about perfection. It's not about perfection at all. If you make mistakes, so here, you know, you, if, if you're, if you're doing it to give, you know, and, and again, that's in another workshop, but it, it still comes down to being so centered on what are people going to think of me? All right. And that's where, that's where I'm talking about where we have all this and how to get over this, because there is a way to get over this. Um, so here's the thing, and this is what's tough. You need to be honest with yourself. So here, here's what I'm saying, and you'll see this when I when I, you get this this paper. No, I have that underlined and in bold print. No, and be at ease with your current limitations. All right, limitations change and grow. Don't be frustrated where you are. Here's the problem, and I'm just going to say this, and I'll say this farther on down. If you are not willing to make mistakes and you are not comfortable making mistakes, you're not willing to learn because you're going to make mistakes and you're going to mess up and you need to accept that. I always have people say that, you know, they, they say they were defeated. Defeat and failure are not the same things. Defeat is the end. Failure is the next step to doing it right. You know, and I'm sure you've heard the thing, how many times did Edison fail before he got it right? If you're not willing to fail, if you cannot accept that you're going to fail and that you're going to make mistakes, you are not willing to learn because you'll, ne you'll never learn if you can't accept the mistakes. And I think we're going to come back to that. So um, I'm, I'm going to just give you an example of that. Uh, the limit that you're, the where, where you're at in your music now is going to change. Um, by the way, my, my music has changed. Ah, perfect example. I got this uh, Gary Gellier dulcimer. I play different than I played before I got that instrument. That, that instrument right there has changed the way I play mountain dulcimer and the way that I even see mountain dulcimer uh, because of that instrument. All right. And I've been playing for a long time. I'm learning. I'm still learning. I'm changing. I'm actually changing how I'm playing now. Uh, 
same with with that banjo right there, uh, Carolina banjo. That that really changed how I played a lot, uh, and it it just gave me a different insight. And I'm learning and I'm growing. And you know something where I was at before that, that's fine, because you're going to get better. That's going to change. But but you have to know where you're at and be honest where you're at, not be ashamed of where you're at, not be embarrassed by where you're at, and be at ease with it. And, and I'm going to give you an example. I was in Mississippi teaching a workshop. I, th I thought this was really funny. Uh, there were, I don't know, maybe 15 people in the workshop. And uh, it was Hammer Dalsmer. And I was teaching, and there was a guy in the group who was he, was, he just picked everything up. I don't know if he knew it beforehand, but he was really good. He was not cocky or arrogant. But I'd say, you know, anybody want to try it? And he'd do it, and it'd be perfect. And then other people were, like, struggling. And they all did it. But this guy was just so natural at doing it. So I, I was just teaching normally. I wasn't thinking about any of this. But then a thought came to my mind after we were after he had done that a few times. And I said, I started laughing. I said, I got to ask you all a question. I want you to be honest. How many here are you got upset with him because he played that so well, just like that, and you're struggling? And every hand went up. And by the way, everybody laughed about it. And I even said, does everyone see how absolutely silly we are that we would be upset with somebody because they play better than we play? And everybody admitted it. And then I, I kept teaching. It was a Hammer Dalsam workshop. A few minutes went by and another thought came to my head and I stopped and I laughed and I said, I got to ask you another question. I says, how many in here actually had feelings of hate towards him at one point? <laughs> and three three hands went very timidly up, which I give them the I give them the credit for being honest. But again, everybody laughed and thought how silly we are when we don't like somebody or we get upset because somebody plays better than us. And guess what? You play better than somebody too. If you're a beginner, you still play better than somebody. But wouldn't it be silly for somebody to hate you because you play better than them? And yet we tend to do that same thing. We all have that that feeling of, I can't believe I can't, you know, that kind of a thing like that. Um, I had another guy I was teaching banjo to at the music store and uh, he'd come in every, every week and he would play absolutely perfect. He would play the song absolutely perfect. He played up to speed. Uh, his timing was perfect. He, he was doing bluegrass and every single day, every class day he'd come in, he'd say, I can't do this. And, and I said, what do you mean you can't do it? He said, it's just too hard. And I said, well, okay, it's hard, but let me hear you play it. He'd play it perfect. And he said, I can't do it. I said, but you're doing it. Oh, no, I'm not doing it. And I'm telling you, he was doing it. You know, I was the teacher. He was, if I graded him, he'd have an A plus. He quit after about three months. And I said, why are you quitting? And he said, I just, it's too hard. I can't do it. He stopped himself because he was so self-centered. I don't mean cocky. He was so self-conscious, so self-centered, self-centric, so insecure. So he talked himself out of playing what he was already playing. He, he could play perfectly. And yet in his mind, he wasn't doing it at all. All right. And yes, I agree. That is so sad. It's, it's, it, it, but, but people tend to do that. Um, I hear people every single time, and and they do it jokingly many times, but they self-disparage themselves. Um, they make comments on Facebook about their playing or YouTube about how they can't do it, or or they make a joke about themselves. And and by the way, I'm doing another workshop. It's not done yet. I'm still working on it called Mind Over Music. We talk ourselves out of what we have the capabilities of doing because of our attitude, because of the things that we think in our head about ourselves, how that we can't do it, how we're failures, etc. And and that is sad. So when you get this paper, here's what it says. It says, my goal is not to be, and I got a real long line there, and then it says, my goal is to be, all right, so if you fill in the blanks, I don't care about the first blank, what is the answer to the second blank? That you want to play like you. That's what you want to do. Quit worrying about what everybody else does. Quit worrying about how everybody else plays. Play like you. Play with your own style. Play with however you want to do it. And 
and by the way, there's a difference, and I know you answered that, and you all answered the right question. There's a difference between saying that and really believing that and being content with your playing. Um, you need to perceive your failure as a positive. And we talked about this uh, before. You need to prepare to fail for life. That's what you need to do. You need to be content with that because that's how you do it. Uh, Pablo Picasso, when he was older, was sitting at a cafe outside and he was doodling on a napkin. And there was a woman watching him and he scrunched it up and he was getting ready to throw it away and she stopped him and she said, wait, 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 I wanna buy that. Can I buy that off you? And he, he unfolded and he said, Okay, and she said, what do you want for it? And he said, $20,000. And she said, that only took you like three minutes to draw. And he said, no, it's taken me 60 years to draw. And, and here's what he's saying by that is when, when you put yourself to the music, you know, to music, to art, whatever, he spent 60 years failing, all right? And, and that don't mean he failed that whole time, but take the top player that you know and they fail and they fail and they fail and they fail and they practice and they practice and they practice until they get it right so so keep that in mind to get good at anything takes hours and even years to achieve the success you have to, you have to fail a lot we are told that failure is a bad thing that failure is defeat when the truth is it is a positive stepping stone to accomplishment. I hate to read, but I want to get this in. Defeat is the end. When you no longer fail at something, you have given up on it. All right? So let that sink in. When you're no longer willing to fail, you have given up on it. You've quit. You have to get comfortable with failure. By the way, you have to get comfortable making mistakes. I don't mean you want to make mistakes. You need to understand when you make a mistake, it is not the end of the world. Making a mistake should not stop you from playing publicly. It should not stop you from performing. So what? You're making a mistake. So does everybody make mistakes every single day, including the top performers make mistakes. You're just one of many, many, many. Why are we so self-focused of, but I don't want to look, you know? And, and so you understand, I get it. I really do get it. I'm not being critical. I've been there, but I've gotten to the place where you, it can't be about me anymore. So there's still a way to change that. We haven't got there yet. Um, <clears throat> when you take a baby and they're starting to learn to walk and the baby falls down and cries because it might hurt a little bit, does the baby sit there and say, I'm never doing that again. That hurt. No, you know what the baby does? It gets up and it takes another few steps and then it falls down again flat on its face and it lays there and it might cry and then it, sits there and says, I'm never doing that again. I just failed. Why well, try anymore? You know what they do? They get up and they get up and they get up and they get up and they keep doing it. You know why they keep doing it? Because they have no ego. They, they, don't, they don't know what an ego is yet. And you know when they start getting an ego is when they fall down and somebody laughs at them or laughs, not at them, but they laugh or something. And then they start feeling self-conscious. All right. So in that way, we need to be like babies. We need to just get over the self part of it. Steve Jobs said, stay foolish, stay hungry. All right. Here's what that means. Everyone has an ego. What he's saying is put the ego on a fast. All right. It will be a purposeful acknowledgement of putting things in perspective, of purposely putting the pride in check. All right. So here's what I mean. And, and actually, I'm not going to, we're almost done. I'm not going to explain it yet. The other is stay foolish. Uh, or the, that's actually the first, stay foolish. The secret to success in anything is to realize how much you don't know. All right, so here's what I'm telling you. For those of you who go to church, if you run into a preacher and he knows everything about the Bible and he has an answer to everything, run the other direction. All right, by the way, when you have a, somebody in music who says, I know it all, and now I want you to think about this. They say, I know it all, Here's what they just said. I'm not willing to learn anything else because they've already put an end to their learning by claiming to know it all. Does that make sense? So again, I'm always learning, all right? And so so is everybody. And when you say, when you are a know-it-all, I don't care what it's about, you have set your own ending to learning anything new and nobody can tell you anything because you already know it all. 
All right, and that's a very, very sad place to be. Uh, most people just don't don't realize that. Um, I'll give you another example. You know, people who don't think they can be deceived are the easiest people to deceive for the same reason, because they they have shut the door on wariness because they think, I hope this makes sense to you, they have shut the door on being careful or cautious because they don't think they can be deceived or tricked. So they're easily tricked. Uh, when you think you know there is nothing to know of an instrument, you stop learning, you shut the door on yourself, all right? When you realize how little you really know, and this is true, when you realize how much you don't know, it's hard to take yourself seriously. Seriously. <laughs> I have told people I teach music through the back door, and I do. I don't teach like most teachers. Uh, I don't use tab when I teach. I, I do in workshops, but when I'm teaching on YouTube, I don't use tab. Um, I don't. I don't even think like a lot of people. Um, I try to make things super easy, super, super easy, and I'll tell you why. Because I need things super, super easy. All right, anybody can make something complicated. I work at making things easy to understand. I, I strive at that because that's how I need it. All right. Um, if you've ever seen the video on understanding chords and keys, one, uh, one, four, and five, and I use, I just have people use their fingers if it's on YouTube, if you're not familiar with that. I've had people who have taught piano for years say, oh my word, that is so easy to understand. Because what they do is, is, is and I've had people watch that video and say, that's the first time I've understand chords and keys. Because everybody makes it so difficult. Um, so, so I need it easy, and that, that's why, uh, you know, that I say that, that I try to do it. But when you realize how much you really don't know, it's really hard to take yourself serious. So that, that kind of helps, too, if you realize what you don't know. Here's what my point is. How do you change that? How to get over yourself. Um, how to get rid of the self-focus, how to get rid of the self-interest. And I'm going back to the dentist's office. I was going to say, I can't imagine anybody here who would do that. I can't imagine anybody who would sit there and watch an, an elderly lady struggle with a smirk on their face in our group. But I'm going to be honest with you. I can't imagine anybody doing it in any group. That is beyond me. Um, I mean, that really affected me. That really affected how I see people. I just, It just really bothered me. But then I think of all the other times that we all do things where we're so self-centered and self-centric and so self-focused, and the way you change it in your music is you change it in your life. So I'm going to give you some very practical ideas on how to do this. Um, let's say... How many's ever been to a jam? You're having fun, and you see somebody. You see somebody who looks terrified. <laughs> All right, here's what you do. You put yourself. You starve yourself. You put yourself on hold. You give up what you want to do. What you want to do is have fun and jam. What you do is you put that on hold, and you go over to them and you say, "Can I help you? Do you need any help?" Um, by the way, somebody did that to me years ago because I was in a workshop when I was learning. I was in a workshop. They were using standard notation. I could actually play. I could actually play fairly well, but I couldn't do it with standard notation. And I, I did. I felt stupid. And somebody came up to me and says, "Can I help you?" And I said, "I said, yeah, please, because I'm really struggling here." And afterwards, we did an open, open mic or whatever, a jam uh, where you get up on stage. And I played, and she came up and she said, I am so embarrassed that I offered you help because you really play play better than I do. And I said, you know something? I said, I said, I so needed your help. She said, I said, I felt, so, I said, please don't apologize for that. I said, I felt stupid. I said, I was struggling. I, was, I didn't know what I was doing. And I said, when you came up and you offered that help, it like changed the workshop for me because I, because you, you know, you were there to help me with it. All right. And you say, well, I don't, I don't really play that well myself. 
I can tell you this, you probably play better than somebody else in that group. There's probably somebody there who's still learning below you. So you stop and help them. You say, but I don't want to do that. That's my point. You don't want to do it. The point is you make yourself do it in every area of your life. So here's what I mean by that. And, and I'm telling you, if you do this, it's not going to only change how you play. It's going to change. It's going to change everything in your life and it's going to help you. You go to the store and somebody behind you has less things than you have. Let them in front of you. You say, why would I want to do that? Because what you're doing is you're starting to starve yourself. You're starting to take the focus off yourself and you're, you're putting that attention to somebody else. You're helping somebody else. If you really want to challenge that somebody in front of you has more stuff than you. By the way, it makes, it'll makes it make you feel good. It'll make you feel good doing that. When you're driving and somebody's trying to get out, stop and let them out. Purposefully think and put yourself in the situation and see what can I do to help or encourage somebody else in every aspect of your life. And here's why I'm telling that. If you've ever gone to a jam, you've ever gone to a festival and you see somebody who there who is a jerk and they are, yes, there are people there who are jerks. You know why they're a jerk? Because they're a jerk in every other area of their life. Have you ever seen somebody at a festival who wants all the attention? That's because that's how they are in every other area of their life. If you ever met somebody who is arrogant and cocky, you know why they're like that? Because that's how they are in every other area of your life. So how do you change the music? You change every other area of your life from me, 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 my, my, to how can I help you? How can I help you? How can I help you? What can I do different? Where can I start to starve myself to give to others? Uh, by the way, I saw a video, and I wouldn't do it this way, but there was a guy who he was in Walmart and he actually would cut in front of like three people with like one item and he would just cut in front of them and they were like what are you doing you know like kind of really upset which i get that and then what he did is he paid for every he paid for like the three people behind him and 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 some of those people actually paid for the next person coming and they kept doing that and keep passing that on and and i know this doesn't sound like you know that i'm telling you this will change who you are as a musician how you learn how you teach how you how you are as a musician because you can't be one way here in music and another way in your real life how you are in music is how you are in life you know, uh, they have uh, jam etiquette, you know, workshops on jam etiquette. <laughs> Here's, I could sum it up. Not, not that I don't teach it myself because there's things you need to know, like, you know, when you raise your foot and things like that. But for the most part, if everybody just taught everybody else with respect, like they would want to be treated, there wouldn't be an issue with jam etiquette. There wouldn't be people hogging, you know, the spotlight. There wouldn't be people, you know, playing when somebody's trying to tune but we don't think about other people. We're so, and by the way, I'm guilty of it. You know, I've done the same thing and I've even done it where I get, I get mad at somebody else for doing it. And then I caught myself doing it at the same exact time. And that's why I said it has to be a conscious, purposeful thought. You have to start thinking, you really have to start thinking different than how you normally think. You have to stop thinking like you think. Uh, if we love others better, we are less afraid of how they think of us. The love helps to get rid of the fear. Exactly. I'm hoping this this is helpful to you all. Um, and I'm telling you, I really think, I really do think that this is one of the most important, one of the most important things that I teach. You know why? Because it goes back to if you can change a person's life. You know, and I do have. I don't think she's on. She's she's taken this workshop twice, and. Uh, she said it, it literally changed her life. She said the way that she thinks, the way she responds to other people. And that was actually a comment too um, from Regina. Um, she said she was at a jam having a terrific time, just having fun. And at the break, the leader asked her if she knew how to tune that thing. And after the break, someone had taken her chair away. She said she's been squashed since. People can be jerks. Yes, people can be jerks. <laughs> um, yes, people can be jerks. 
I have a page called Purposeful Humanity. I mentioned on Facebook, and if you want to find that, I would I would join it because, and no, not all are jerks. Um, but the problem is there are jerks, and you have to know how to deal with the jerk. Um, I had somebody make a comment in a Facebook group that was very very snarky about me, um, very snarky, and I didn't respond back publicly because I'm not going to do that. Uh, I, I really don't like when people do that. I don't think it's the right thing to do. I'm being honest. I don't think it's the right thing to do. You should go to that person individually and talk to them. I went to this person individually and they said that they were trying to spare my feelings. But another person, a friend of mine also went to them and they admitted they were being snarky. That They admitted they were being a jerk to me. So the person lied to me and I called them on it because I, I knew the truth. And and here's the thing, and I, I, you know, I'm not preaching to anybody. Here's a Bible verse, but here's what it says: as if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, be peace, uh, peaceful with all men. So here's what that means: if it be possible, sometimes it's not possible, but don't be like them. All right, and and I've got a whole thing on this. Uh, don't if they're a jerk to you, don't be a jerk to them. Yes, people will hurt your feelings. You cannot change that kind of a person. All right. Um, that wasn't called for. And I'll tell you what, seriously, what I would have done had I been there, I would have got that leader aside and say, you know, there's a, a better way to do that with somebody else, not not yourself. It's always easier to defend somebody else. But there are people out there like that who, who are jerks. And... <laughs> You know, for those of you who, who you haven't done it yet, uh, for those of you who have not taken the Get Over the Fear workshop, I'll tell you how I got over my fear is because of a jerk, because of a family that were really, they were, they were horrible to me. And it got me to the place of realizing, you know something, this is not about me. It's about them. You know, they're the one, and it wasn't just with me, they're, they were like this with other people. But it was to the point where I didn't want to go to festivals anymore because of these people. They were controlling me by how I let them make me feel. And I got to the point of not caring anymore because you can't change another person. I, I sympathize with you, I really do, because that's, it's unprofessional and it's uncalled for. But there's a whole lot of people out there like that. My wife's, my wife is very smart. I'm, I'm telling Kim, she's listening. She is, she's very smart. Um, I struggle with, with YouTube. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, this honestly does not bother me because I don't get a lot of unlikes on my videos. Um, and I'm not also not getting millions of views on my videos. But I don't, I don't get a lot of unlikes uh, on my videos. I had somebody unliking every one of my videos immediately as soon as I posted them which I think is funny. It's probably a competitor. I actually put a video out and thanked them, whoever it was, for unliking my videos because it was helping me with my ratings with YouTube and it stopped immediately. Um, but I was talking to my wife and I said, I don't understand why people don't like certain videos unless it's like a political thing or like a, you know, a Christian thing or like a philosophical thing or, or something where there's opinions maybe involved. And I said, uh, I said, like if somebody got up and played something music, I would never unlike it. You know, and here's what kills me. You can, you can go, I saw a video of Stephen Seifert. Stephen Seifert's a phenomenal Mount Dulcimer player. And he's got, he's got a bunch of unlikes. He's got lots more likes, but he's got a bunch of unlikes. And I sit there and I think, so why in the world would you, what, what is it that you don't like about it? There's a guy I like, it's called Man Plus River. He snorkels, he finds things under the water that people have lost. He returns it to them free of charge. He'll have 20,000 likes and 8,000 unlikes. And it's like, why? Like, what don't you like that you would give him a thumbs down? And uh, so I was, I was talking to my wife about it because I really don't understand it. Um, and maybe because I'm a YouTube creator, the way I see, see YouTube is different. If I go to YouTube and somebody helps me unlock my car door, I give them a like. If they help me understand how to uh, fix plumbing in my house, I give them a like. 
because they have spent hours doing that and they've actually helped me. But there are people who just don't. And, and Kim said to me, she said, so if you didn't like a video on YouTube, what, why would you give it an unlike? And I said, well, I wouldn't do that unless it was like political or religious or, or something about my faith or something. She goes, no, no. She said, like music. And I said, well, I wouldn't. And she says, but what, what would, why would you do it? And I said, but I wouldn't. And she said, you're not listening to me. Why would you? And I sat and I thought, I said, I wouldn't. <laughs> she says, you're not listening to what I'm saying. If you did, what would be the reason for you doing it? And I sat and I said, because I'm a jerk. And she said, exactly. And the fact is, there are jerks out there and you need to know, you just need to, you just need to let it go and don't try to fix them and don't let them like somebody posted already, rent space in your head. All right. You just, you just let it go. And again, not everybody don't just don't be them. Somebody said they're not all jerks. They're not. Don't be one. You know, try to help somebody else. Try to be encouraging to somebody else. But I do hope it's a blessing. I hope it's helped. And if I could be of any help, anybody, please let me know. And uh, thank you so much for attending this workshop. All right. Talk to you later. Thank you for, for joining. Bye.